Hi again, everybody. My name is Alan Heckman. Maybe you've seen my other videos, but just in case, it's worth saying that I am a group facilitator. So that means I'm an independent contractor. I go into other organizations and help them with their big meetings or their events or conferences. Um, and uh, I also teach group facilitation methods, and I do that with ICA UK, which is a small organization that I love. So if you want to learn more about group facilitation methods, come and see ICA UK. We get lots of different questions on our training courses, and uh, one of the most common questions is about what do you do when it all goes wrong? What do you do when people are really difficult or when, when people just don't want to engage? Um, and so we're making a few videos around different tips and tricks, and some of those are related to what to do when you've got difficult behaviors in the room. I made another one not too long ago about dealing with over-participators, but I want to ask the opposite question as well. What do you do as a group facilitator when somebody's not really stepping up and not ready to engage um, and not participating in the way you would hope in you know giving their ideas, um, g uh, engaging in the content, uh, making the making sure that the topic moves toward decision and action. Well, the first thing, as always, that I want to do if so, if I'm dealing with a situation like that, is see if I can understand where that person is really coming from. So, um, as always, it, even same with over participators or indeed with anybody, uh, you know, in their minds it makes sense. So, you can't be just annoyed with them as a facilitator, worried about. Um, about them not speaking up. They're not speaking up for some reason. So I've highlighted a couple of the reasons, uh, sorry, I want to highlight a couple of the reasons that I think that people might not participate. So what are some of those? Here's one. One is that they might just be self-conscious about speaking up. Sometimes there's a language issue, they're not confident in the language you're using, um, or sometimes they feel, you know, they feel a little bit afraid of speaking up. Some people are just afraid to speak up in groups um, or nervous about that. Um, so that's a totally normal thing to not be able to speak up and assert yourself confidently in front of 20 people. And you can't limit participation to people who are confident. As a facilitator, you wanna make sure everybody is able to participate. So one of those kinds of ways of of being afraid of speaking up is about deferring to hierarchy. So even people who are quite confident normally might find themselves keeping quiet when their boss or their boss's boss is ac across the room, which is often the case when you're planning strategy um, or doing something like that. So sometimes you get people who might be confident in a different situation but are afraid to speak up when they're afraid of being judged in that way. Another one, and you would, uh, is uh, if somebody is uh, angry or doubtful of the value of the process. If you've ever done any kind of public participation, public consultation on behalf of a local authority or a, a housing trust or a planning consultation, something like that, you know that a lot of the time somebody, somebody who shows up at those meetings is actually sure they're not really going to be heard. They arrive ready to be angry, ready to be sure that the process um, isn't really actually a participatory process. It's just a tick box exercise. Um, then they're, they're mad about it. So sometimes, every once in a while, they sit there mad in the back of the room and they won't tell you why. Well, sometimes it's because they're sure that they won't be heard. Um, and so, uh, so that's a common situation is that somebody who's angrily doubtful of the actual process. And then I want to highlight one more, which is that every once in a while you get people who are bored, tired, or actually hungover. Now, if you're working in a professional context, hopefully people aren't coming to, <laughs> to work hungover very often. But uh, I will tell you that in multi-day conferences and events, some people are networking a little bit too much too late into the night and they show up uh, in person, but their mind isn't quite ready there at 9 a.m. the next day for the event. So you have to figure out how to try to engage these people to the extent it's possible. Now, these are all different ways of non-participation, right? They're different causes. They're obviously related to each other. What I want to do now is to offer you a few of the quickest and easiest ways that I have as a group facilitator for dealing with these kinds of situations um, or these kinds of behaviors. How can I gently encourage somebody along so they feel comfortable participating? I've got more methods and we might make some more videos about some of the other methods but I chose four quick ones to share with you um, these are four good ones I think because they're ones that anybody can have a have a try at doing so uh, let's talk about what those are first of all if somebody is uh, uh, angry or self-conscious one of the things you can do as a facilitator is what I call skip the cringe now, you're a facilitator, that probably means you love icebreakers and energizers, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But I will tell you that right now, that there are people in the room, in your participants, who do not love icebreakers and energizers. Uh, they hate the feeling of them. So I'm not saying throw them out, because honestly, I think they, I'm, what I am saying is, 
uh, they need to be done the right way. So I'll give you a couple tips. Um, if you're doing icebreakers and energizers, you need to make sure that you're earning their trust rather than demanding it. So what does that mean? If you're telling somebody to speak up at the beginning of the course where they've never met anybody and, oh, I don't know what a good one is, tell them to, you know, tell them to, uh, tell the history of their shoes or do something like that. You know, sometimes whatever your icebreaker or energizer is, for some people it's quirky fun, for some people it's, oh, no, this is going to be that kind of meeting, and it turns them off. So what I'm saying is that they're, you're asking them to trust you and to trust the group before they're ready. So you need to hold on to those things until you until they're ready, until they've built that trust naturally um, by sharing their values and by talking. So you, you remember that your job as a facilitator is to earn that trust uh, rather than demanding it, especially in the early stages. At the end of the group, maybe if people are getting along, then you can do something like that. Another thing that I want to say about whatever your icebreakers or energizers are is you tend to be less cringy if it's clear how it's directly relevant and useful to the topic you're talking about. So instead of getting having people get up and do star jumps in the middle, maybe that's fine, but somebody's going to be mad at you. Instead of doing that, have them get up and do a voting exercise where they move to one side of the room for one option and the other side of the room for the other option and make the vote something that's light but actually relevant to the topic you're talking about. Then you've successfully got them moving without hopefully making them horrified about the prospect of participating. All right, so that's one. Skip the cringe if you possibly can. Now here's another one that I want to offer to you. Um, this one says, use processes that invite lots of kinds of input. So we've got lots of ways of doing that at ICA, but uh, what I mean by that is don't demand that everybody speak up to a room full of 20 or 50 or 100 people to get their point across. Instead, give them options to write things down on flip charts or write them down on cards and get them up on the sticky wall. Um, give them chances to describe something to a small group instead of to the whole room. So there's great ways to do that. Um, one of the, my favorite ways is by switching back and forth between small group work and large plenary group work. And so I'm asking different kinds of input in those two different ways. Um, and that allows people who to participate wherever it is that they're comfortable participating. And another key thing here is that one thing that I absolutely love is ICA UK's consensus workshop process, which is one of the great strengths of the consensus workshop process is that it does this. It's really hard to get through it without participating because there's so many gentle and kind invitations to be engaged in the process. So the ICA's UK, ICA UK's uh, group facilitation is a really good way to go with that. Um, let's stick with another one here. Uh, especially related to this one about when somebody's angrily and doubtful of the value of even engaging in, engaging in the process. I want to offer that what you can do as a facilitator is first of all share exactly how the group's product will be used. That seems that makes it more real to them and makes it clear that it's not just a tick box exercise. So as a facilitator, I will often say, what I'm going to do when we're done today is take the ideas that you came up with directly to the board for use in their strategic planning process. I only say that if it's actually true, but whatever is true, I say it so that it's clear that it's not just going in a file folder um, and it's not I'm not just doing the exercise to make them feel like they participated without really getting to participate. So I explain that there. Um, and then I want to offer this one. It seems a little bit obvious. It's snacks and coffee. I will tell you, if you work particularly in the UK, particularly in the public or the academic sector, over the last 10 years, snacks and coffee have disappeared from meetings or you have to bring your own. And I will say to you that if you are working as a facilitator, bring your own if you have to. Because especially if somebody's tired, if somebody's disengaged, it's amazing how much goodwill you can buy simply by allowing them to adjust their own blood sugar and caffeine levels. If they've got a, if they've got a biscuit in their hand, they're much more likely to be able to participate than if they don't. So I would say don't skip it. It's not a, uh, an optional. And if your organization won't bring it for you, then find a way to bring it on your own. All right, those are four quick ideas. Obviously, definitely ask questions if you want to. We would love to talk to you in the comments. So, um, so please do share and speak up. Um, and the other thing I'd love to ask you to do is uh, please do give us a like if you did you if you did like this video. Definitely share it if you want to share it with anybody who you think needs to know. And to subscribe if you'd like to make sure you see all of our video content that we produce. And as always, you can always check in with ICA um, if you want to know more about our training courses and the methods we teach. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I'd love to see you soon. Take care. Bye.